starting a series and it's called Free. And last week I talked to you about being free through grace, free by grace, free by grace. Today I want to talk about being free through faith. The Apostle Paul who wrote the book of Galatians was the one who penned it in the book of Ephesians when he said, we find salvation by grace, but through faith. And last week I talked to you about the grace of God, that it is not performance-based, but it is person-based. And Jesus is the person of grace. He is grace personified. And it's not about what we can do. It's not about what we bring to the table because we fall way short. Can I get an amen? And so guess what that means? We're all in the same boat together today. And I believe that today God's got a word for you. And there's a way to define grace as we tie from last week to faith this week that I think maybe you can bring forward into your life. It's G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Aren't you glad that we get God's riches at Christ's expense? Grace was not free, but it comes freely to us. And the grace of God is both free and it's freeing. But we don't have access to that grace except through Faith. And so Galatians chapter 2, Paul's continuing his journey of writing to the churches in Galatia, in that region, and we're going to look at what he was dealing with, and it's a continuation of what we looked at last week, which is there were these Judaizers who were saying that faith was definitely the way to salvation, but it was Jesus, faith in Jesus, plus all of these dietary restrictions and circumcision. It is faith plus something else. But Paul's message and the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is that faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes through the Word of God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and so that means we get grace for free, and it's Jesus plus nothing. That's the gospel that Paul was proclaiming, and it's the gospel that we dig into today as we look at this theme of what Scripture calls, and a, a church theological word we often use to describe what Paul's going to go into today is justification. Somebody say justification. And I'm going to talk to you about what that truly means today as Paul walks through that with us, but today is all about faith. And you know what faith calls us to do? Faith calls us to not settle where we started. I think you're here because you don't want to settle where you started. Faith is not an end, it is a beginning. And your faith has brought you to this place, and the call of your faith is not to settle where you are. It's not to settle where I started because my God met me where I started, but he's taken me somewhere new. Can I get an amen? He's not through with you yet, and faith will never allow you to settle in. In your notes, there's a statement that I just truly believe, and Paul is declaring it in his writing to the Galatians, and it is that where there is no faith, there is no freedom. Where there is no faith, there is no freedom. Faith is foundational to freedom. If you're not feeling today very free, I want to invite you with me today to spend a few moments checking your faith because I believe it is that faith that is the foundation to us finding this freedom that we're digging into today. Faith is a lot about your perspective. I feel like I've talked about perspectives a lot over the past several months here at Blackhawk, and maybe it's because I need a perspective check, but maybe you can join me in that. And I've, I've learned about God that it is how I perceive God that often determines how I'm willing to receive God. And sometimes we need to check our perception of who God is so that we can better see who we are, and then our perception turns into a way that we can be open to a reception of what God has for our life. With open hands today, are you ready to receive what God has for you? I believe there's freedom gonna, that's going to come in this room today. I believe freedom is going to be found. Some of you didn't think freedom was possible for you, but I believe that today, by God's grace, through faith, somebody's going to be set free. And Paul is really dealing with in this book, and we're going to dive into just two thoughts today that come from verses 1 through 21, the entire chapter of Galatians. But it's this tension that we often feel when we read the Bible between belief and behavior. 
Have you ever noticed that there seems to be a, a little bit of a tug of war in Scripture between those things? Because we say, Paul writes in Ephesians 2, it's by grace through faith that we are saved, not of works, lest any of us should boast. But then we read James, who writes toward the end of your Bible, that faith without works is dead. And so how do we reconcile this, this seeming tension between belief and behavior? Belief and and behavior. Am I saved by behavior? No. But can I believe without some behavior following? No. So how do those things come together? They're in Scripture. And Paul is helping us to address that tension, belief and behavior. Two things that faith is going to do from Galatians chapter 2. Number one, faith writes. It's going to write some things that were wrong in your life. We're going to talk about that tension. Faith writes. Verses 1 through 14. I want to read that to you in a second. But before I do, can you answer this for me? Have you ever noticed that your faith has a way of straightening you out? You won't listen to that person in your life, perhaps, that was trying to straighten you out, but as soon as you take a few moments, dig into the Word of God, spend some time in prayer, you find that your faith will straighten you out. Can I get an amen? That's what I mean by faith writes some things. It turns some things around. Let's dig into that together. Anybody ready for the Word this morning? Galatians chapter 2, I'm going to read the first 14 verses because that's where we see this picture, really two pictures I'll paint for you within this context of how faith will write some things that perhaps get wrong in our lives. Paul continues and he writes this, Galatians chapter 2, there are Bibles in the seats around you, I invite you to join with me, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version today, which is the same version as the Bible in your seats, but follow along in whatever device or Bible you have with you today. Verse number 1 of Galatians 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet, because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. Verse 5, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And I'm so glad that it was. Verse 6, and from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality, he wants us to know. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, Cephas, by the way, is Peter, also known as Peter, means rock, that's who he's talking about there, James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Verse 10, only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Verse 11, but when Cephas, this is Peter, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Verse 13, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like the Jews? And all God's people said, we got some work to do, so let's get at it today. Let's talk about how faith writes. There's a lot of stuff in there, and a context for some of that is there's the Jews and the Gentiles, two totally different people. There were ethnic tensions, there were religious tensions, there were socioeconomic tensions, there were status tensions, they were very different. The Jews felt like they were on a different tier, but then Paul was called to preach. For 14 years, it says, he's been doing that, preach to the Gentiles, the sinners, the uncircumcised. That's why that enters into the 
equation if all of these crazy words that seem so out of our context don't make sense to you. That's the difference. Paul is speaking into that because he believed, and as do we, and we live based on the fact that the gospel applies to people, period. But yet, there were these Judaizers who were saying, nope, it only applies to certain people, and it's Jesus, yes, these other people, and we can come to the conclusion that the Gentiles, they can come into our faith, but they've got to follow our Jewish customs. They've got to follow our dietary restrictions. They've got to be circumcised. It's Jesus plus those things. And then, yeah, sure, faith can apply to them too. Jesus then entered the scene and said no more. Jesus changed history. That is the gospel message that Paul is proclaiming today and still through his word to us today. So let's talk about how faith writes. I think there are a couple of different ways we run from God, and faith will straighten us out sometimes. We run from God first. When I hear run from God, I think about times in my life where I ran away from God by breaking his rules. Wouldn't that be kind of where our minds typically start? Like, I break the rules of God. Maybe I'm a hypocrite in that I'll say, I believe in Jesus and I'm supposed to follow after him, but then I go out into the world and my actions don't show that. That's the typical mindset that we bring to the table when we hear running from God. But Paul is making the case to us today, as am I, that that is a way to run from God, but another way exists. Sometimes you can look the part You know, the behavior looks really good, but the belief on the inside is still off. You can really put on that church smile and have the image and reputation that you think you're called to have, but on the inside, you're running away from a personal relationship with Jesus. Have you ever been there? You ever had the church smile on? You look the part, you look like you had it all together, but on the inside, you're crumbling because you're running from Jesus privately, even though publicly everything looks like it is okay. That's another way to run from God. Is anybody with me or is that just us pastors who feel that? Mm, Okay, yeah, we're all in that boat too, aren't we? There's a lot of ways to run from God. So that would be legalism. That's what Paul's talking about. That's what he's fighting against. Legalism is looking good on the outside. He called the Pharisees legalists and said, you're like a whitewashed tomb, pretty on the outside but full of dead bones on the inside. That can be us. So legalism, licentiousness is another way of putting it. That's just hypocrisy. That's where we take liberty and we take license to go out and act with our behavior different from what we claim we believe. But there's a tension with those things. And I know, and by the way, Paul, you think you've got a corner on either of those two ways of running from God? Paul is the ultimate example of both. Paul has more Sunday school pens than you. He knows scripture way better than you do. He had a perfect attendance. He was Mr. Perfection. He was on the rise in the Judaism and in his religious and educational system. He was the man. He has a corner on the legalistic market. But then he has a corner on this other market as well where you run from God by, let me ask, just don't admit this if you have, we just don't want to know, but I don't think many of you probably have gone around killing Christians. Well, guess what? Paul did. He ran from God by breaking the rules. He killed Christians, yet he was the guy who was on the rise in that religious system of his day. Paul has the corner on those markets, and he's proclaiming what he would call the answer to both of those ways we run from God, and it's the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus. It's justification by faith. It's faith and faith alone in Jesus. Faith can right my wrongs and reverse my running. Is anybody glad of that today? Faith can right my wrongs and reverse my running. Now, I want to talk about those two ways we run. First of all, legalism. Verses 1 through 10, we saw a picture of legalism as Paul walks through this. Last week, I talked to you about legalism uh, as simply working by our own power and or by our own rules to earn God's favor. And we're bad about this in the religious world because we like things to go how we want them to go. And so sometimes we'll take a godly principle and turn them into rules that maybe we set, and then we operate with our own power around those rules and make it as if that we have to do that, Jesus plus something. Can I, can I get an amen? You've been in churches like that before, where it's Jesus plus something, our own rules, and then our own power to operate within those rules so that we can have the favor of God. And if you don't operate that way, you don't have the favor of God. 
But the last time I looked in the mirror, I realized that I don't do very good operating by his rules, much less rules that I add to his rules to begin with. And because of that, I need God's favor given to me freely. And that's exactly this gospel message. Verses 1 through 3. Paul was preaching to the Gentiles in thousands at this point. 14 14 years he's preached to the Gentiles. Thousands have followed him. And yet there's this loud minority in the church. You ever seen that happen before? Well, Paul had those as well. There was a loud minority speaking against this Jesus plus nothing gospel, still saying that it's Jesus plus something else. And it was all of the circumcision. It was the dietary laws and restrictions. Paul's point was pretty simple. In verse 1 of chapter 3, we're going to look at it next week, he says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has pulled you aside? Are you not listening? Do you not get what this is all about? And so maybe this is going to be one of those do you not get it moments for somebody, for me, for you in this place today because maybe you've been living under the bondage and as Paul calls it, the slavery of trying to hit and check all of these boxes. And some of you, I know where your mind's going. It's like, well, but if I don't try to check the boxes, then I'm not very godly. And I've learned, I want you to hear me, I've learned that godliness never comes from me ever. But I've learned that the more I pursue a God who is godly, He equips me and empowers me and commissions me and sends me out and gives me everything I need that pertains to life and godliness. I'm not godly, but He was godly on my behalf. And because He's godly, I can live a godly life. It doesn't come from me. It comes from Him. Everything else, anything else is this legalism that Paul is trying to battle. Now, he brought with him Barnabas and Titus. Did you notice that? First few verses. Barnabas is a Jew. Paul is a Jew. Titus was a Greek. He was one of those bacon-eating, uncircumcised, non-Jewish people. He was one of the Gentiles. But he brought both of them to this council of the apostles to check this gospel that he's preaching. He's been doing it 14 years. He wants to ensure there's still some alignment there. So he brings these two knuckleheads with him, Barnabas and Titus. And he's the chief of knuckleheads by his own words. doesn't say knuckleheads, but it's, it's a good translation in my opinion. And in verse 4, did you notice that, so they're there. They're speaking with this council, the apostles in Jerusalem. Did you notice that it says that some had slipped in to spy out their freedom? They were coming in trying to be divisive, but you know, I think that relates to many of us, maybe you today in this place that you've come in, you slipped in to spy out this freedom that we talk about in Jesus, like you, you slipped in the back, you don't want anybody to see you, and I'm not saying you're a Judaizer, you're not one of those divisive people trying to tear the church down, I hope, you know, if you are, then maybe God will deal with you on that too, but maybe you slipped in and you're just trying to spy out what is this church thing all about? Is it really for real? I hear all these people talk about it, but I see hypocrites in the church, and I want to see what it's all about. And so I think maybe you can relate with what was going on there. But then it's verses 5 through 10 that really has one theme. And he goes through all this, the circumcised, the uncircumcised. They seem kind of influential, but it didn't matter if they were influential to me because people are just people and God shows no partiality. That's really the point. Verses 5 through 10, he's saying God shows no partiality. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you came from. I thank God that he shows no partiality. And so here's what Paul is saying, that no matter how good you think you are or how bad you think you are, grace and faith levels the playing field. Because we are all human and we all fall short of the glory of God and his grace and our faith has entered the picture because of Jesus and Jesus alone. Nothing but the blood has leveled the playing field. So that means we're all in this together. Can I get an amen? And that's also why as he talks about these Judaizers, he said we wouldn't submit you notice that? Nothing. We would not yield to them. We would not submit to these people who are preaching another gospel. Can I tell you something that's so important today, folks? Have you noticed that you got this thing called the phone that you, you can click, and in a second you can research a theological topic, you can research a lyric, you can research a curriculum, you can research anything and everything in the palm of your hand. And I want you to know, in churches, in the books that you're buying, in the music that you listen to, in the curriculum that you use in ministries, in this church, in other churches, there are wolves who are trying to sneak their way in to even some of the good stuff that's out there. And so here's what I want to tell you. It's not my job. Are you ready for this? I'm going to speak plainly for a minute. It's not my job or the job of this church to police all of that for you. 
You know what faith has done? It's given you the opportunity to boldly approach the throne of God. It's given you the opportunity to have an investigator's mindset. It's given you the opportunity, and I challenge you towards it, to never take my word for anything. Research the Bible for yourself. I'll do my best to feed you as a shepherd and under-shepherd of the shepherd and to give you inspiration and to challenge you forward, but don't depend on me. Check everything you click, check everything you listen to, everything you watch against the word of God because you have been given everything you need to have that kind of investigator's mindset, to be a self-feeding Christian. So important for us to do in this day and age. And I challenge you with that, to let faith write some of the things that may be getting you off course. Second thing is hypocrisy. Verses 11 through 14, faith writes, it writes legalism, but it also writes hypocrisy. You ever met a hypocrite? Ever been one? We've all been there. I love this knockdown, drag out fight. Paul is talking about Acts chapter 10, if you want to research it further. Acts chapter 10 is where Paul confronts Peter. Paul, Peter was there at the church at Antioch, which is a part of the circle that Paul is writing to. And the church at Antioch was started based on a time when Peter had a vision. And the vision was that it's okay to eat with the Gentiles. It's okay to do that. But then when the Jews came in and he was sitting and eating with the Gentiles, he separated because he was afraid of what they might think. You ever been there? He was a fr- well, you know, those unchurched people, they're, they're kind of they're wild and crazy, so I got to make sure I separate. And so Peter did that, and Paul challenges him. He confronts him to his face. Can you, this is pay-per-view in Christianity. You think Mayweather fights or whatever it is, they're the big ticket. No way, no how. Paul versus Peter, knock down, drag out, pay-per-view moment here in Christianity. But Paul confronts Peter and basically says to him, you hypocrite, you hypocrite. You say you believe, belief behavior, you say you believe that the gospel's for everybody, yet you won't sit with certain people and eat with them because you're afraid of what other people might think. You hypocrite. That's what Paul, this is tough, Galatians is is tough sledding, folks. When we went in this book, if you wanted a touchy-feely book in the Bible, Galatians is not it. Paul's pretty upset. He doesn't want these people to be led astray, so much so that he was even willing to confront Peter himself, and he did just that. Have you ever noticed that hypocrisy and legalism spreads like wildfire in the church, in your world? Well, that's what happened. Even Barnabas was led astray. Even sweet encourager, he was known as the encourager. Barnabas, exhorter, even he was led astray by the hypocrisy. My heart breaks today because somebody in this place has been led astray by hypocrisy. Some of you haven't been at church in a long, long time. You know what the number one thing I hear as a pastor when people say, well, I won't go to church? It's because it's full of hypocrites, he said it. It's full of hypocrites. You know what I like to say? Every time I like to lead with this, this is a softer lead-in to a pretty harsh um, ending that I like to give with people. I always want to say this, and I do many times. I'll say, you're exactly right. It is so full of hypocrites. And it added one more when I became the pastor. And then I'll say, and you know what? You should still come because one more won't hurt. (laughs) You only say that in right company. But I want you to know, when you come to Black Hawk, if you've been led astray like Barnabas because of hypocrisy in the church, I want you to know that I'm still learning this, but I'm learning, I-N-G, I don't have it figured out, that it's best for me to define the church of Jesus, which he said is my church. I'll build my church, and even the gates of hell can't prevail against it. That it's better for me to define Jesus' church by Jesus, who built it, who owns it, who created it, than by that of the people of his church. Because guess what? They will let you down. And so it's time for somebody to start defining the church of Jesus by Jesus and Jesus alone. And then guess what? The hypocrisy, the legalism, the things that have deterred you from the church, they become secondary because your eyes are fixed on Jesus, who's the author and the perfecter and the finisher of your faith. And you start to define the church by him. And then guess what you end up doing? You start to be the church. And the more you be the church, the more the we of the church can't really penetrate your heart like it used to. I wanted to encourage somebody with that in this place today because faith will write 
some things in your life. Some, it will reverse some running. It will right some wrongs, the wrongs of legalism, the wrongs of hypocrisy. Faith will also unite. Faith unites. Number two, verses 15 through 21. In these next seven verses I want to read to you, we see how faith unites us. It brings us together. But the word justified is used five times in these seven verses, so it must be pretty important. So I want us to talk about what does it mean to be justified and free because of faith. But faith will unite us. Verse 15, continuing on. Everybody still with me this morning? This is some heavy stuff, but man, is it transformative. I believe somebody's finding some freedom. Let's continue digging into the freedom of God's word. Verse 15, Paul continues and he says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. Verse 18, for if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Verse 19, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. And then Paul writes one of the words that defines the book of Galatians that you are going to continue building on for the rest of this series we're calling free. In verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, that's us, you got a flesh suit on today. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by what? I live by what? I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And I believe that Jesus died for a purpose, and that purpose is you and me. And this faith will unite us. You notice verse 15, he starts with Jew-Gentile. And remember, that's religious tension, that's socioeconomic tension, that's ethnic tension, that's all kinds of tension. All the tensions that, by the way, you notice in the world around you today. Mm -hmm. Can I get an amen? It's all around us. It's a divided world, but faith will unite us. I believe that right beliefs will ultimately lead us to right behaviors because of faith, not because of you. I believe the more we believe in our hearts, see Jesus for who he is, we start to see ourselves for how he sees us, and then we start to see the people in our lives in a different light. So those right beliefs lead us to right behaviors. Does that mean you're going to be perfect? Everybody do this. Mm -mm. Not even close, but it's going to change the way that you live. Faith rights our wrongs. Legalism, hypocrisy, you fill in the blank. Faith will unite us around our beliefs, and it'll start to unite our behaviors. And so I want to quote a guy you may have heard of. He's just a little old country preacher. You probably hadn't heard of him. His name's Charles Spurgeon. But if you've been around church very long, you've probably heard his name. He may be new to you, but he gave what he called three. This is in the 19th century, by the way, 19th century London. Charles Spurgeon gave what he called three main dividers in society. And it's amazing to me how true these still are today. I want to talk about all three as we look at Paul's talk about justification by faith and how it unites us. The first one is, you can jot these down if you want to, is the pride. They're all pride, by the way. God's going to get rid of some pridefulness in somebody in this place today, starting with me, because I'm the top of that list, just like Paul as well. The pride of race. The pride of race. Our cultures, our cultural distinctives are beautiful things. Can I get an amen? It's part of who you are. It is a part of your identity, and we embrace and welcome and come alongside all ethnic backgrounds, all socioeconomic backgrounds, all generations, all people, all together for the glory of God and for the sake of the gospel. We're a church for all people here at Black Hawk, just so you know. But I love that we do have these cultural distinctives, but Paul had those as well. But he wants people to know in Galatians chapter 2, but also in all of his other writings, that 
after my identity in Christ, all of the rest of these defining characteristics, all of my cultural distinctives, all of the ways I'd often define myself, they become secondary. And this is where we get into trouble. And I believe that this is where the church often gets so divided by topics of race, by topics of politics, by topics of you fill in the blank. We get so divided so many times. But Paul in Philippians 3, don't turn there, but you may remember a verse where he says, he's talking about his identity in Christ. And he says that, you know what, all these things, because remember he's educated, remember he's a Jew, all of these things. He's got all these cultural distinctives, ethnic distinctions, socioeconomic, political, religious, you name it, educational. He had all these distinctions. But he said in Philippians 3, I count all of this as rubbish. Rubbish, garbage, if you will. But, you know, I looked at that word this week because it's really his message here in Galatians 2. The word is scubalon. Somebody say scubalon. You didn't know you could speak in Greek, but you just did. And I just led you to say a bad word in the Greek too. Because that word in the King James is actually translated as dung, nicely, politely translated as dung. That's what Paul's talking about. He is saying that, you know what, all of these things that are good things, my political identity, all, whatever identity I would tie to myself, they're okay, but they are nothing. They're scubalin compared to my identity in Jesus Christ. Look on the screen. I want to give you your identity in Jesus. This is your identity in Christ. There's your identity, that's you, that's who you are, and here's what we will often do. We'll put another part of our identity up there, and let's go with politics. I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm an Independent, I'm a this or a that, or maybe it's your ethnic background. Maybe you say I'm black or I'm white or I'm Hispanic or I'm mixed or I'm this or I'm that, and you put your ethnic background and identity up there. Go ahead. Now we add another one to that, now our national identity gets into the mix here. We're going to put that up there. Americans, maybe we're Asian, European. And here's what we do. We end up placing these identities right up next to our identity in Christ. Now, let me ask you, are those things on the right in those three circles, are they bad? No. Some of you say, well, it depends on, I don't like the Republicans, I don't like the Democrats. But that's kind of my point because here's what happens. Can I have some grace for just a minute? We'll get so consumed by those kinds of identities, and that is why we often can't talk about politics in the church. Yes, why when you have a discussion with a Republican or a Democrat and you're one of the opposite ends of that spectrum, you are immediately divided and you can't talk about it anymore because it's so close to the heart of your identity and who you are. The same thing happens with race. Why is it that we can't have a cordial nice discussion about whether or not it's appropriate for football players to kneel in protest and during the national anthem to the racial discrepancies that happen in our nation. Why can't we have that discussion? In this room, there'll be so many different opinions, but I know as soon as we have it, so many people can't talk about it anymore. Or we talk about America versus this country versus that country, and I want you to know all of those things, all of those opinions, they are distinctives that matter. And I think they should matter. So don't hear me preaching that they don't. But I will say, I want to quote Paul, because he says all of those things. He had a racial distinction. He had a religious distinction. Denominations could go up there. We could do so many more circles. He had all of those. But can I tell you what Paul said? He said, all of those are garbage, rubbish, scubalin compared to my identity in Jesus. And so this happens. And we move those away from our identity. They're still there. They still matter. They still are a part of your makeup and who you are, but now they've become secondary to the primary thing that consumes and defines you, and that is your identity in Jesus Christ. I pray that sets somebody free. And you know what happens when that becomes your primary identity? You start to be able to have discussions and conversations with people who don't look like you, people that don't vote like you, people who disagree with you, who have a different background, who look different, whatever it may look like, be like for you, you can start to engage people because then you see people through the lens of an identity that does take those things into consideration, but they're now far secondary. They're rubbish compared to what it means to know Jesus Christ. May we be a church that's defined by our identity in Him, because faith will unite us. And you're thinking, you said you had three, and I'm going to go through the other two really quickly. That's the pride of race. This is Charles Spurgeon. I pray, did that help somebody in this place today? 
Maybe it's time to be consumed by your identity in Jesus and all those things that do matter will not quite take the cake like they maybe always have. And you'll be a part of uniting instead of dividing. That's what the call of the church is. The pride of race is a divider. Number two, the pride of what Spurgeon calls face and place. Face and place. Now, that's my status. This is my talents, my accomplishments, my achievements. But can I, and it's, it's where it's the fit and the fat. It's the rich and the poor. It's you look this way and you look that way. All these distinctives, the accomplishments that maybe we would want to lord over somebody else because we're better at that than they are. Face and place. But two things. Did you know that if you were born in a third world country as an orphan, and maybe some of you were, did you know that you probably wouldn't have all the same accomplishments in your life that you have right now? That because of where you were born, because of the grace of God and where he's placed you, that you're given the opportunities that you're given. Is that fair to say? That life could look different if we weren't given the place, the face, the family that we were given. But let me take that a step further. How worthy are those things, your skills, your accomplishments, your successes, how much do those things justify you before God? Not only were they really kind of handed to you, really, if we're honest anyway, but what do they do in scope of eternity? Are you going to get to heaven and say, God, let me in because I was a CEO? God, let me in because my bank account was bigger than their bank account? God, let me in because I had a bigger name in my community than my neighbor? How well do you think that's going to go? It's not going to go very far, and it's the pride of face and place. And, you know, a lot of times, and, and here's what I'll tell you, when it comes to eternity, before God, there's one kind of sinner, one kind, hopeless and dead, and that's you, and that's me. But by grace through faith, we can come to know Jesus. I may not be beautiful now, you know, and don't say amen, I'm watching. <laughs> I may not be beautiful now, but one day I'll spend eternity clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. So I can spend 70 years ugly because I know what's coming. I don't have to care about this division, this pride of face and place or race. And then number three, he talks about the pride of grace. And he kind of argues this one may be the worst of all. This is where my behavior has been so good, it leads me to a distinction or superiority over other people because I'm better than they are. And we would all say, I would never do that. But he says so many times in the religious culture, we'll lord our superior lifestyle over other people. But there's, can I tell you, when it comes to race, when it comes to face, face, when it comes to place, and when it comes to grace, too many aces. I can't even say it. I'm sure he preached it way better than me, but I'll, do, I'll give it my best. Can I tell you, there's one human race, and it is you, and it is the people who don't look like you, and guess what? We are all, all, all separated from God because of our sin. We are all, we all fall short of God's glory. So there's one race, there's one distinction. We're all in it together, and I thank God Jesus entered that mess and said, you know what, I'm going to offer grace through faith. I don't commit certain sins, often we'll say. And we'll hold that over other people. But can I tell you today, just because God, because of his grace, kept you from different layers or manifestations of sin that others may have entered into, it doesn't mean you're something different than those who went down that route. That sin that you think, well, I didn't commit that one, it doesn't give you any kind of distinction. Uh, I read something even this week that I thought was a great statement. It's that the seed of every sin is in every human heart. And I think that's so true. You didn't have to teach your kids to sin, did you? But every sin, the seed of it is inside of us as we are in this fleshly body. But Romans 3, if you believe any of those div dividing factors, read Romans 3. I promise you it'll change your perspective. And I want you to know that nobody in this place thinks we are superior to you, even if you don't believe. This is a place you can belong before you even believe because we know we're in this together and we all need Jesus. Faith writes, and it also unites. And as I look at those verses, verse 16, I told you I wanted to find justified, and I want to give it to you very simple. It's really a legal term. If we have any attorneys in the room, uh, justification is really a declaration. Justification is a declaration. It's a declaration of innocence. You're declared innocent, like in a court of law. That's what it's talking about. But can I give you the Kevin definition? I heard it as a child, and I've always remembered it justified, to be justified by faith is simply this. It means that it's just 
if I'd never sinned. Justified means it's just if I'd never sinned. And have you sinned? You can nod. We can be real. You sin, but Jesus made it just if you had never done so. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There's a statement in your notes that I want to remind you of today, and it's that there is nothing you can do to make God love you more and nothing you can do to make Him love you less. Justified, never sinned. He loves you. Can I have your eyes for a minute? Somebody needs to hear it. Not hear it, not hear it, but hear it. Jesus loves you. He has not given up on you in this place. We died to sin so that we could live to God. I'm now, this is what Paul's talking about, I'm crucified with Christ. It's not I that live, but He, Christ, who lives in me. Four, five times in those seven verses, this word, even the word righteousness in 21 is the same word for justification. It's the same Greek word. We're justified because of our faith. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me. Close your eyes. Nobody's looking around. I'm going to give you just a couple of moments to respond. It's the most important time of the day. You've listened well, and here we are, but the gospel applies to you. Maybe it's time for you to be saved by grace through faith. Faith. Freedom comes through faith. Where there is no faith, there is no freedom. That's the good news of the gospel. I'm not here to lead you in a prayer today because I believe your heart is screaming a prayer to God in your own words. And if that's you, if you would say, I'm separated from God because of my sin, and I know that I need to be justified through faith, then I want to give you a moment to cry out to Jesus, just in a silent moment here, just you and Jesus. Will you cry out to him with your own words? Jesus died on the cross for you. And when he died on that cross, he paid the price, the penalty for all of your sins that you couldn't pay, those same sins that separate you from him. He died for you. He paid that price you couldn't pay. After living the sinless life you could never live, he paid that price for you. While he was on the cross, he thought about this moment. And then he rose from the dead. And when he did, he defeated death, hell, and the grave so that you could receive that victory. Salvation is received. It's not achieved. It's not of works. It's by grace through faith. Will you cry out to him in your own words and ask him to save you? And he'll do just that. In the silence of this moment, I just want to give you a moment to be still before God. If you're a Christian here, you're a believer, maybe it's time for faith to write some things or unite some things in your life. But for somebody, I believe you entered from death to life in this place. If that is you, then I want to give you a next step. Nobody's going to pull you out of the service. I want to tell you what we can do to walk with you because you've just entered into a new life. If that is you today, I want to ask you to do one simple thing. I want to pray for you on the count of three. I just want to ask you to raise your hand and say, pray for me, pastor. I decided to give Jesus my life. I said yes to Jesus today. Are you ready? One, two, three. Lift your hand. Lift it high right now. I see you, sir. God bless you. Who else? Say today is that day. I have been saved. I've entered from death to life. At least one of you might see you, ma'am. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Who else? Boldly say, today's that day for me. Wave me down if I miss you. I thank God for his salvation, for the freedom that comes from faith in the word of God. God, I thank you for those who've raised their hands, for those who are finding faith, writing some things, uniting some things in our lives. God, I, I feel like we've done some heavy lifting through a big chapter in your word today, but God, what freedom we have we found? and for salvation to be brought from you on your throne in heaven to these people. I thank you and I praise you for it. And I pray it all in the holy, powerful, matchless name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Let's celebrate. Welcome these to the family of God. Join the angels in heaven.